435 in your hymnal, 435. Since Jesus came into my heart, let's all stand together. What a wonderful change in my life has been brought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure Since Jesus came into my heart And no dark clouds of doubt Now my pathway obscure Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus This morning, welcome to 2016 and uh, first Sunday of the year. Hey, you're one for one. First Sunday of the year, and you're in church, amen. You're batting a thousand. That's great, and uh, good to see you here today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, higher ground is the theme for 2016, and we're excited about what God's going to do in 2016. And uh, we want to press on the upward way. We want to say, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And uh, there's only one direction for a Christian. That's forward. Okay? And uh, I'll just be seated. I'll preach. Okay? No, I won't. Stay in uh, let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to gather together here today. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's made their way here today. And, Lord, we're praying for those who are uh, still battling sickness and unable to be here. And I pray that you'd... Put your healing hand upon them. Strengthen them. They could be with us very, very soon. Now, Father, we pray that you will be pleased with the service this morning. That, Lord, bless the music, our fellowship together. Honor the preaching of the Word of God. And, Lord, uh, start us off right here in 2016. Use this service to put us on to higher ground. And Lord, I pray you would put that passion and that desire in our heart not to stay where we are but to move on to higher ground. Lord, bless this service to that end. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Right, you may be seated. Do not wait until the need of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Someone far from harbor, you may guide across a bar, right in the corner where you are. Just above a clouded skies that you may help to clear, let not narrow stop your way apart. No room to one heart alone may call your song of cheer, right in the corner where you are, right in the corner where you are. Right in the corner where you are.
Someone far from harbor you may guide across the bar Right in the corner where you are Here for all your talent you may surely find a need Here reflect the bright and morning star Even from your humble hand the bread of life may feed Right in the corner Someone far from harbor, you may guide across the bar. Right in the corner, right in the corner, right in the corner, where you are. All right, let's turn over 246 together. 246. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground on that first together. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on singing this morning. Now listen carefully if you would. A few announcements for us today. 5.30 we'll have our Christian growth class and uh, this will be an uh, important class tonight. We're going to talk tonight on why we use the King James Bible. Uh, there are fewer and fewer churches you attend today that use the King James Bible. You may say why do you guys use the King James Bible? We're going to explain that to you tonight. So if uh, and maybe you're not a new Christian, but you're curious about that subject and why is it that we use the King James, then you want to come to that class tonight, 5.30. It's in the conference room right across from the nursery. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to have, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew and all the scholarship and everything. Uh, we'll show you right from the Bible, uh, our Bible, why that we use the King James Bible over all the other versions that are out there uh, that are available and uh, why we use that. So that's at 5.30 during the Christian growth class. During our 6.30 service, which is right here in the auditorium tonight, I want to uh, talk to you about uh, defeating depression. Defeating depression. You know, over the holiday period, a lot of people get depressed. Uh, there's a lot of suicides uh, at this time of year. And so I want to I give you some help. If it doesn't help you, it may help somebody you know. And so uh, tonight, 6.30, defeating depression. And I think it'll be a help and encouragement to you this evening. Then, uh, schedule this week with our midweek service on Wednesday night and uh, the RU uh, Ministries Thursday at the prison and Friday here at the church and then Saturday at the prison, our 
bus visitation and soul winning Saturday morning at 10. And then uh, Saturday night is our workers' dinner, okay? Uh, if you haven't signed up, get on that list now, all right? We purchased the, the food and uh, we know what to expect. But if you work here or if you don't, if you're not involved in the ministries and you'd like to be, you ought to come to our meeting on Saturday night and find out what it's all about. There'll be, you'll see the opportunities there are to serve, what the qualifications are to serve, and uh, you can see where the Lord might have you get plugged in uh, in a ministry here at Bible Baptist Church. Five o'clock, Saturday evening, and uh, there's a nursery for children. There's going to be a, a, a program for the older children. Uh, up through sixth grade, teenagers on up will all come to our meeting. Uh, but for the younger kids, John and Emily Combest, missionaries uh, to the Congo and Uganda, they're going to be running a program for the school age children. And then Mrs. Moreland and Grace will be watching the smaller children in our nursery. And so everybody will be cared for, all right? We'll all eat together. And then when we come in for our program, they'll go to their places and uh, they'll have something fun to do as well while you're in our meeting. Okay, so it'll be a great night on, on Saturday night, and uh, we kind of lay out uh, the coming year and uh, get geared up for higher ground, all right? Saturday night, 5 o'clock for the workers' dinner. Okay, I think that's all I have right now. Let's take a moment. We'll welcome any guests we have with us today. Uh, anybody here today for the first time? I think we got some right here on the front. Well, not really the first time. I was talking to Michelle, right? And uh, she and the girls had come, I think, for country fair. And uh, they wanted to come back and see what the uh, church service was like. So she brought them all along. And uh, good to have you this morning. Thank you for being here. That's great to have you. Yeah, you can give them a card, Brother Bill. Give her a card. I don't know if she, I don't think she got one during Sunday school. Good to see Joe McKay here this morning. And uh, miss Joe the last few weeks. Glad he's back. And uh, I... Um, I thought I saw Debbie. I did see Debbie. There she is. Good to see you, Debbie. Glad you're back. And uh, that's good. Right. Anybody else that I didn't see or I've missed? All right. Let's give these folks a warm welcome, shall we?
193 in your hymnal, 193. I traveled alone upon this lonesome way, but Jesus and me. Jesus and me, 193. Let's sing that first together. I traveled alone upon this lonesome way. My burdens were heavy and dark with my day. I looked for a friend, not knowing that he had all of the time been looking for me. Now it is Jesus and me. dismissed to go to junior church we'll sing that last together forever i'll sing of his great love to me forever i'll tell it on land and on sea i'll stay by his side contented i'll be for all of my life singing this morning let's go over to 523 523 i sought a flag to follow a cause for which to stand let's all stand together as we sing 523 we'll sing that first all together i sought a flag to follow a cause for which to stand i sought a valiant a stirring challenge some noble work to try to give my life fulfillment my dreams to satisfy I found them all in Jesus the life the truth the way beneath this flag I'll take my sense Amen. Great one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
I sought a ringing answer for all my doubts inside. A torch of truth uplifted my searching steps to guide. I sought a word of wisdom, a true authority. I sought to know life's purpose, to solve its mystery. I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath his flag I'll take my stand and follow him today. Let's sing that last all together. Did you find your seats? I sought for satisfaction, for yearning deep within on that last together. I sought for satisfaction, for yearning deep within. I sought for full deliverance from chains of guilt and sin. I sought for peace and pardon, for freedom from my fears. I sought the hope to Where's this come from? I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath his flag, I'll take my stand and follow him today. Everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Great singing today. Wonderful. Ushers are coming. Uh, they should be here by now. We got a slow group this morning. And, uh, fellas, it's time to give. Let's, let's be anxious to get the money. Amen. And uh, hope you're anxious to give in 2016. And uh, hope you've seen the Lord faithful to you. Uh, through 2015 and anxious to give in the new year for 2016 a couple of prayer requests this morning um, don't have a name for this one but it's a uh, friend of Thelma Blystone uh, a lady who lives in her complex there her daughter it's a young mother of four uh, she's in hospice care she's got a tumor uh, at the base of her brain and uh, she's going to pass away and so uh, pray for this young mother and uh, pray for these four precious children uh, that are going to need a place to go, okay? And then we want to remember Tanner, uh, Tanner Jarvis. Uh, he's uh, uh, Adam and Alicia's young little boy who uh, broke his leg, remember, and they had to put a pin in it, and the, the pin comes out tomorrow. And uh, there's an infection, but it's just dealing with that pin. And so just pray that all goes all go well tomorrow as they take that out, and uh, the healing will be good, and uh, they'll be able to... Uh, heal up just fine and no no ill effects from that whatsoever okay so uh, remember those requests if you would uh, as we pray together this morning all right let's pray together brother abrams lead us in our prayers today for the offering if you would there you go. lord our heavenly father we come to you once again uh, uh, on a wonderful day to worship you and uh, we want to uh, ask you to bless this offering multiply it as only you can lord and uh, bless our uh, pastor as he brings the message. And uh, uh, we know it's, uh, it's, it's not him, but uh, we'll ask that you put him out of the way and uh, that your word go forth and touch each heart and go up and down each aisle. And, Lord, uh, uh, do the work that uh, it was meant to do. And, Lord, we love you, Father. And for all these things in a new year, we're so blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>
Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, if you would, please, for our scripture reading. First Corinthians four, we're going to read verses one through ten. One through ten of First Corinthians chapter four. I'll begin on verse one, then you join me on two, then I'll read three, together on four. We'll alternate like that till we end together on verse number ten of First Corinthians chapter four. And as our custom is, let's stand together, please, to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the readings of our scripture here this morning. Father, we pray that you will prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive this word from your word today. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring your word and speaking to holy men of old. And Lord, preserving it, Lord, preserve for us so that we hold copies of it in our hands this morning. Lord, I believe it's quick. I believe it's powerful. It's powerful. And I believe it's sharp. I believe it's sharp. Two edged sword. And I ask you that it would do its work in each one of our hearts and lives today. Father, bless the special. Father, bless the special. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, God of this God world, of this world. Miller, Miller, I have renounced all sin, all sin, so bless Jesus, Jesus,
nothing be nothing between my bride or thou or friend or friend not shall not dig to me no it may no it may cause me much tribulation I am Father, as we bow in prayer now this morning, I pray that there will be nothing between our soul and the Savior and that you'd hear that song that we just sung, not just as a song, but as a prayer, and that, Lord, you'd grant that prayer this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you'd uh, not allow our mind to wonder, our mind to be distracted from listening to your word today and giving it our undivided attention. And Lord, I pray as we listen carefully this morning and you would allow us to hear the still small voice of the Spirit of God. And you would speak to each of our hearts today and we would, we would glean the truth here from 1 Corinthians 4 that you gave the Apostle Paul to give to these Corinthian Christians. And that you would allow these truths to help us to move on to higher ground. So Father, help me as I bring the message and help each of the people as they listen. May your will be done in the next few moments. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, our theme for 2016 is higher ground. Higher ground. And let me make sure we understand something, that that doesn't just mean do more than last year. All right? Uh, sometimes people measure... How many, ever, how many have ever heard the statement said that... If you're not doing more this year than you were this time last year for God, you're backslidden. You ever heard anybody say that? Hmm? Yeah. And reality is, that's not a true statement. Okay? Sorry to burst your bubble. But uh, you can, you know, here's, here's the thing. You can start out, let's say, let's say I start out reading uh, 10 pages of the Bible a day. Okay? Uh, now, that, now, that means the next year, if I don't read at least 11 pages of the Bible a day, then by that definition, I'm backslidden. Well, now, I've been saved over 50 years. That means I'd have to be reading 60-some pages of the Bible a day or I'm backslidden. Is that true? Can that be possible? No, it would not be possible. If you win souls to Christ and you led, 
let's say you led one person to a week to the Lord, 52. Well, you'd have to lead at least 53 to the Lord this year. Or you're backslidden. But you know, it's funny, when I, when I read the Bible, God says that He is the Lord of the harvest. And God says that He gives the increase. That's not up to me, it's up to God. Oh, I could get converts for sure. But I'm afraid they'd be my converts and not God's. And, and I've had my share through the years. I wish I hadn't, but, I, but it's true. And, and uh, one day, uh, somebody said to D.L. Moody, Yeah, Moody, I saw one of your converts down at the bar last night. He was drunk as he could be. And D.L. Moody said, Well, you're right. He's probably one of my converts. He probably wasn't one of the Lord's. And uh, he was honest enough to maybe admit that. So I, I want to make sure we understand that. When, when you look at that term, higher ground, don't turn off right away and think, how can I do more? I'm already doing everything I can. I already got my pedal to the metal. All right, That's not what we're talking about when we talk to higher ground. I do want to help you, and I think, I think Paul lays it out for us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, understand the church at Corinth that he's writing to was a very immature, very fleshly, very sensual church. They were saved people, but they were allowing their flesh to still control them. In other words, we're, we're, we're now, once you're saved, before a person gets saved, all they have is a soul and a body. Their spirit is dead. Alright? So they're, they're only a two-part being. What, what comes alive at salvation is God quickens our spirit. He makes alive our spirit. And now that our spirit is what comes alive and it's our spirit that bears witness with God's spirit. His witness bears witness, His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the part of you and me that communicates with God is our spirit. That's why the lost man doesn't communicate with God. His spirit's dead. He, that's why the Bible says that, that the, the unsaved man, the natural man, cannot understand the things of God. He's spiritually discerned. He, his, his, his discernment, it's broken. There's no communication there. That's why one of the most dangerous things an unsaved man does is study the Bible. Because he, he, he's going to get wrong interpretations of what the Scripture says. So here's, now once you receive Christ your Savior, the Bible says, you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. That's your spirit. It comes alive. Now, listen, now that I'm saved, when I'm unsaved, I'm just soul and body. You know what your soul is? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. What you think, what you want, what you feel. And that's how people live who are lost in this world. Well, I think I'll do this. Well, I want to do this. Well, I feel like... And that's what we live on. Because that's all they have. Now, we get saved and we have the Spirit. The Spirit tells us what God wants. And what God thinks and what God feels. Now, we don't follow the old manager of the soul. We follow the new management of the Spirit. That's why the Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. What you want, what you think, what you feel. The Corinthians were saved, but they weren't walking in the Spirit. They were still walking after the flesh. They were still walking after what I want, what I think, what I feel. They, the Bible calls them carnal. Carnal simply means fleshly. Okay? So they're still living under the old management. Some Christians today live under the old management instead of the new management. That's another message, but that's just a, uh, to lay the foundation here uh, for this. And so Paul is trying to get them to understand how to walk in the Spirit and not to walk in the flesh. He's trying to teach them how to go to higher ground, so to speak. And by the way, you won't get any higher ground than walking in the Spirit. Okay, that's the, that's the high ground that you want to get to. And we're going to look at chapter 4 this morning. And I'm going to point out five keys to higher ground as a believer. Five keys to higher ground as a believer. Number one is to remember that we are servants. Remember that we are servants. Notice verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's inquired in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. Notice verse 1. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of 
Christ. The word minister there is the word servant. All of us are ministers. I know sometimes you look at the pastor of the church and say, oh, there's the minister. No, the truth is, by the way, the pastor ought to be a minister. In that sense, he ought to be a servant. But the truth is, everybody's a servant if you're a child of God. And, and, and don't forget that. We, uh, see, the Corinthians, were, they needed to understand what much of the world needs to understand is that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. What, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, I mean this. God says the way, the way up is to first go down. God says that, that the way to get is to give. God says the way to save is to lose. The way to win is to lose. See, it's just the opposite of what the world says you need to do. And God's ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are not our thoughts. So God says, you want to go to higher ground? You have to start with the low ground. You have to remember you're a servant. We are ministers of Christ. Jesus said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give my life a ransom for many. Jesus said, I didn't come to have people serve me, though He would have had every right to have people serve Him. He was the Lord of glory. But He said, I came to serve. In fact, He took His coat off one day and He girded Himself with a towel and He knelt down and He washed the feet of His disciples. He did the job of a servant. When those men were in the room before Jesus was, and any one of them could have taken the, the basin and taken the towel and knelt down and begin the process of washing the feet, but nobody was wanted to be a servant. But Jesus led the way. He reminded them we're servants. We're to serve one another. Now, if you're going to be an effectual servant, there's three things you have to keep in mind. Number one is you have to discard what other people think. You have to discard what other people think. Notice what Paul said in verse 3. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Paul said, you know what I think about what you think of me? Not much. Okay, That's the slave ball literal translation. He said, I just don't think about that much at all. He said to the, church, the, the churches of Galatia, he said, do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You'll never be an effectual servant for Jesus Christ if you're just concerned about making everybody else happy. Because you won't do it. You'll never be able to please everybody else. And please God. You remember, we're servants... We're ministers of Christ. And so I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus was getting at when He looked at His disciples and He said, if you love father or mother more than Me, you're not worthy of Me. You don't love brother, sister, father, mother, any of the more than Me. Then, In other words, if you say, listen, if, if, if I have to please you, then I'm not pleasing Christ. Now, if by pleasing Christ I can please you, praise the Lord. But I'm not going to please you and get off course of pleasing Christ. I cannot do that. And so you have to understand, you cannot, you have to discard what other people are going to think. People are going to think, man, you don't have to be that dedicated. You don't have to do those things. Why do you have to be at church so much? Why do you have to be involved? Why do you have to go there? Why do you have to do that? You don't have to do those things. And you're going to have to discard what other people say. And say, I'm following Christ. Discard what other people think. The second, the second key to being an effectual servant is you have to discard what you think of yourself. This may be harder than the first one. Notice what he said back in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3 again. When he said, it's a small thing that I'd be judged of you all or a man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. Because he said, I know nothing by myself. Yet am I here not by justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. He's saying, listen, I'm not going uh, to even think of myself and I don't even try to judge myself. Paul wasn't much on self-introspection. 
He just didn't do it. And, and you know what we find is common with most of us? We all try to justify ourselves. We always try to put ourselves in a good light. And it didn't, listen, you, you think about it all the way back to when you were kids. If your parents come in and you had an argument with your brother or your sister and your mom or dad say, okay, tell me what happened, you tell your side of it. And it always made you look right and you were good and they're the problem. And then they talk to them and they'd find out that, no, they're right and they did everything right, you're the problem. And mom and dad would figure out, well, the truth is somewhere in the middle here. Because we always like to make ourselves look good. And we always try to justify ourselves in our, own, in our own light, in our own eyes. That's why someone said when you look into a mirror, it's funny, you, don't, you, you begin as you look in the mirror more and more, you don't see the imperfections in yourself. But you know, what, you know when you see them? It's when someone takes a picture of you and you look at the picture. And you say, wow, am I really that heavy? Wow, am I fat? You know what I mean? You see that. You say, man, I don't see that when I look in the mirror. You know why? Your, li- your eyes lie to you. Well, I look in the mirror, I don't look that old. But boy, that picture sure I sure look old. Because the camera, they say the camera doesn't lie. Okay? It will be honest with you. And so, don't, it's not, listen, it's not self-approval that I seek. That isn't what I'm after. It's God's approval I'm after. So I'm discarding what other people think if I'm going to be an effectual servant. I've discarded what I think about myself. In fact, the truth is, the Bible says I shouldn't be thinking about myself at all. Thirdly, we have to determine to please God only. That's what Paul's saying. You determine to please God only. He that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. You know why? Paul said, I'm discarding what you think. I'm discarding what I think because you know what? Ultimately, the only one that matters is God. I'm going to stand before God one day. And, and, and He's going to be the final judge. And by the way, He's the only one that can, can be the righteous judge. Why? Because God sees not just the outside, God sees the inside. You and I can't pass judgment on somebody else because we don't know their heart. And by the way, you can't judge yourself because you don't know your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? When the Bible says, be not deceived, he's not just talking about someone else deceiving you. You can deceive yourself. You can deceive yourself with faulty thinking. Your mind's done that all the time. And and you can deceive yourself. Your heart is deceptive. So the only one who knows my heart, by the way, who can know it? What's the answer? God. He's the only one who knows my heart. That's why David said, when he said, Lord, he said, you search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. David said, I know I know myself well enough. If I look at my heart, I'll overlook stuff. But I want you to look, God, because you'll point out the wickedness that's there. And so God is the righteous judge. And so listen, if I sit in the seat of judgment on somebody else, then I'm sitting in the seat of God. I'm taking His place. How arrogant is that? How proud is that? Then I'm presuming that I know somebody's heart. I can't know their heart. And neither can you. Here's a great... By the way, verse 5 can be a frightening verse. You, you look at that. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Now here's what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and He'll make manifest. That means He's going to make known. It's going to become obvious the counsels of the hearts. God is going to make known in that day when we stand before Him. He's going to make known not just what we did. That'll be obvious. He's going to make known why we did it. What, are, what, were the, what was the counsel of our heart? What was the motive of our heart? 
God's going to open those up for everybody to see. Now, at face value, you look at it and say, man, that's not going to be real enjoyable. <laughs> because like Paul, we could all probably say, I find that even when I do good, evil is present with me. <laughs> Sometimes we have motives that aren't always the right motive or the pure motive. And God says, I'm going to reveal those, but wait, the verse doesn't end there. The great part about verse 5 is the last sentence. It says, Then shall every man have praise of God. That's an amazing statement. Because it's fearful to us at first thinking, man, you know, what scares us sometimes is somebody, you know, laying bare our soul, so to speak, to somebody. And letting somebody know our innermost thoughts are things that we're aware of. We think, man, they know what I'm thinking. They know what I have this thought. Boy, they won't even do it with me. And God says, I'm going to lay it all open and yet I'm going to find something in every man to praise. If God, who knows everything about us, can find something to praise in every one of us, don't you think we ought to? Don't you think there's something that you could find in every single person that you could just thank God for? And not try to find the bad thing? And not try to find the thing you don't like? Hey, leave that to God. Let's find the thing we can praise for. Praise Him for. That's a great, great thing. God's, God will find something to commend, something to compliment. Kind of like the woman who always liked to compliment the pastor. Always liked to try to compliment his sermon, but one particular day it was just an awful sermon. Hopefully not like the one you're listening to. And she's trying to figure out at the end of the sermon as they walk out the door what she was going to say to the pastor. Because it was just awful to listen to. He was all over the place. She didn't know what he said. And so finally as she got to the door, she finally came with the thought. She shook his hand and said, Pastor, that was a wonderful text you had this morning. <laughs> That's all she could say. <laughs> Maybe find something to compliment you for. But listen, God will find something to praise every man. That's the first step. First step is, remember, we are servants. We're servants. Say, well, I think I am a servant. Yeah. Literally, the, the word servant in the Bible, you, you study that. It's one who eats the dust. Well, I think I am a doormat. Yeah. Just serve. That's all. We're just servants. Don't you know who I am? Yeah, you're a servant. Don't you know my title? Yeah, you're a servant. Okay? Just, just be a servant. The second thing, the second step to going to higher ground is remember not to compare. Remember not to compare. Look at verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And if thou didst receive it, why didst thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? You say, man, don't get puffed up one against another. If you read earlier in the book of Corinth, in, in the Corinthians here, they, were, they had favorite preachers. One said, I'm of Paul. Another guy said, oh, I like Apollos. Man, is he eloquent. Boy, Apollos can do it. Others said, oh, I like Peter. Man, Peter can shell the corn, brother. He's a preacher. And boy, they just, they all their faith. Then others were real pious. They said, oh, we like Jesus. We just follow Jesus. And they were all puffed up one against another, having their favorites. And Paul said, what are you doing? He said, I've, I've talked to Apollos about this. Don't, don't you believe anything that you, that you read? Listen, he, he told him earlier in chapter 3, some plant, some water, but it's God who gives the increase. You can't, neither is he that watereth anything, neither is he that planteth. Hey, if I'm not anything, what am I? I'm nothing. You know what you are? Nothing. We're just a bunch of nothings. That God does something with. See? That's what you have to remind you. So we don't compare with anybody else. We're servants obeying the Master's orders. 
We're servants obeying what the Master has told us to do. Whenever you get puffed up, you be sure pride is present. You be sure that pride is there. Verse 7 asks some questions. Tell me the answer, church. First question. Who maketh thee to differ from another? God. What hast thou that thou dost not receive? Nothing. Because everything we have, we've received from God. Now, if we've received it from God, we didn't have anything to do with it. He said, why are we glorying as if we didn't receive it? Why are we glorying as if we did it ourselves? Like we did some great thing. Why do I want the praise? Why do I want everybody to acknowledge me? Why don't everybody to, to look at me? Hmm? Because of pride. Listen, receiving praise ought to be a very uncomfortable thing for a Christian. Ought to be a very uncomfortable thing. There was a king in the book of Acts named Herod. He gave a speech one day. Look this way. Look this way. I know he's cuter than I am, but look this way. He's... All right, if, he, if he keeps talking, just step out in the hall, okay? The... He made a great speech one day. And apparently it was pretty good. Because you know what everybody said? Everybody said, oh, it's not the voice of a man, it's the voice of God. And Herod, instead of deflecting that praise, say, no, no, it's just me. Let pinch me, I hurt. He went Barney Fife on and went, yeah, that was pretty good talking there, wasn't it? You know what? He took the praise for himself. You know what God did? God struck him dead just like that. And they watched the worms come eat his body, come out of his body. Pretty gross sight. And God was, listen, was that just, uh, that just in there to, to give us a gruesome story to read in the book of Acts? I was there to teach us something about when we take praise to ourself that belongs to God. God takes that very seriously. What does a servant take credit for? You know what I notice? with the great football coaches, when they win games, you know who they give all the credit to? Their players. Oh, the guys just played with a lot of heart. The guys just played a great game. Boy, they executed. They just did great. But you know what I also notice? When they lose the game, you know who they blame? Themselves. They take the blame. Well, I didn't prepare them well enough. I don't think I had a good game plan. I take, the, I take the blame on this. They, they take the blame themselves. See, that's, that's greatness. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be for the believer. And so we, we don't compare. So listen, if we're all nothing and we're just servants trying to please the Master, we can't compare one with another. Because we all have different jobs to do. Remember, who maketh thee to differ from another? God did. God didn't make us all the same. I told Brother Wallace the other day, man, if everybody in this world was just like us, it sure would be a better place to live in, wouldn't it? No, it'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Huh? No, no, no. We Listen, God made us all different. And so don't look at somebody and say, why are they like that? Because God made them that way. That's fine. It's okay. And so we're, we can be different. And God gave us different abilities. God gave us different gifts. And we are different. And it's okay. But we have no, listen, we, have, we never have occasion, we never have reason to be proud. You study the Bible, the word the proud is never used in a good light in the Bible. It's easy. We get in that, I'm proud of you. Or I'm I'm so, I cringe every time I hear the song, uh, I think it's Statue of Liberty, isn't it? I'm so proud to be called a Christian. 
You see? I mean, I, I'm not proud. Sometimes you see that on Facebook, you know. Hey, repost, you're proud to be a Christian. What? It is, it is never in a good light in the Bible. Hey, the first sin of Satan, pride. I will be like God. I will ascend to the high. I, I, will, be, I will sit in his throne. Pride. Learn, Jesus, you know, when God, when Jesus was baptized, he didn't say, that's my beloved son, I'm so proud of him. God said, in whom I am well pleased. But try, to, try to tell your children you're not proud of them. Try to say, I'm pleased with what you did. I'm pleased with you. Boy, avoid pride. Just avoid it all you can. It's tough. It's so much a part of our fabric. <laughs> it's hard. To, you'll catch yourself saying it a lot. But catch yourself. You say, I, I, I don't want to. I want to fight pride at every God. The songwriter said, not have I gotten, but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it. Since I have believed, boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. That's what we're talking about. So number one, we're servants. Number two, don't compare. Number three, remember to die to self. Remember to die to self. Verse 9, For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed unto death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. The word spectacle there is the word we get our word theater from. We're made a, a theater. Similar to the amphitheater that they had in those days. An arena and most of it just what you picture if you've seen the movies where they're all in the stands and they release the Christians and they release the animals out to fight the Christians. And when Paul says he's appointed us last, you know, in the early, the, the first release of the morning when the, when the crowd is there, they actually gave the people in the arena weapons to fight off the animals. But as they got to the noon hour and it was the last release of the day, they just let those folks out with nothing. They were just going to die. There's no hope of fighting off the animals. And that's why Paul said, I think he's chosen us apostles last. We're the last ones to go out. We have, we have nothing. We're appointed unto death. He said, we're gonna, we, we, we know what we're heading for. And, so, and he's saying, and so we're, we're in a theater. Folks are watching. Who's watching us? Look what he said. The world, angels, and men. They're all waiting on the conflict. Hebrews says it's a great cloud of witnesses that watch us run the race. And they're observing how we live for God. They observe, the, the, everyone observes the struggle and the race and the conflicts that we go through. And he says they're, they're all watching us. They're watching the struggle. They're watching us as we press on the higher ground. So let us run with patience the race that is set before. Let's remember they are watching and they're cheering us on. But notice what he says in verse 10. Here's a picture of somebody who's pressing on for higher ground. Notice what he said. We are fools for Christ's sake. Notice. We are weak. We are despised. That's what Paul said he was. And then notice what he said. Notice his description of the Corinthians. Just the opposite, wasn't it? Notice, he said, but ye are wise, ye are strong, ye are honorable. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think was the better Christian? Paul or the Corinthians? Where do you fit in? You look at that list, Are you fools for Christ's sake? Are you weak? Are you despised? We have people say, well, I don't want anybody to think I'm foolish. I don't want to look weak. I don't want to be looked down upon. I don't want to be despised. Isn't it better to be thought wise and to be thought strong and to be thought honorable? Oh, that's what we want. That's what the flesh wants. 
That's how I want to feel. Verse 11, Even under this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the off-scouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Paul says, listen, Christians in that day were blamed for any public calamity. Any wrongdoing, Christians got the blame. And they took it. Now this death is not just physical death, but I think he's referring to the fact that, like Paul said, I die daily. You have to be willing to die to yourself. If you're going to be a good servant, you have to be willing to die. Die to your appetites. Die to your desires. Die to what you want. And desire only what God wants. I was reading something earlier this week talking about how entertainment driven our churches have become. The promotion for most churches is the sound and the, the lights and the, you know, the, the entertainment of the whole service. It's a production. And one, one pastor said, we're going to Wonder how many folks would come if we just said all we're going to do is we're going to come and study the Bible. No music, no singing, no big lights. We're just going to come, sit down, open the Bible, study the Bible. I can't remember what he called the service, but he, the second thing he did, he had it on Friday night at 6 o'clock. It was a large church. But on that first Friday night, 600 people came. I'm not sure how long of a time period it was. I don't recall reading the article. But over, over several months, that service grew to be their largest service of the week. Having as many as 2,000 people come. You know what that is? That's encouraging. To know that there's people who will come. Hey, generally, what happens is you have a concert, you might as well, you can run out Nationwide Arena and pack it out with 18,000 people. But you say, we're going to have preaching. You're lucky to get 18 people. But there's no entertainment. Because we, that's what I like. It's what the flesh likes. The flesh doesn't care much for preaching. Your flesh this morning says, isn't he about done? Doesn't he know it's 20 to 12? Okay. Yeah, I'm aware what time it is. But you didn't have me last week, so i got to get in this one. Right. <laughs> Servants, don't compare. Die to self. Number four, remember our disposition. Remember our disposition. Paul said, we labor, verse 12, working with our own hands. Notice what he says, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. Whew. All the apostles suffered for Christ, but they also suffered after Christ. Example. They watched Him. Oh, I know. Hey, listen, Peter followed afar off, but he did follow afar off. He did see. We don't know if the other apostles saw or not. They might have all saw from a distance. But when you go over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 21, 22, and 23, it talks about what Christ did. In fact, I'm going to look there. You can turn if you want there, but I'm going to go there quickly. 1 Peter 2, where the Bible says this, For even two, here, here and two were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us the example that we should follow His steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. When reviled, you know what reviled means? It means when you're reproached, 
using contemptuous and vulgar language. Notice what Paul said he did when he was reviled. We bless. When somebody uses vulgar and contemptuous language to me, I bless them. What is, what is bless? Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are they the hunger and thirst. Of the blessings. What do we say blessed means? Happiness. You know what I wish? I give them a wish of happiness. Huh. Wow. When persecuted, said persecution is punishment or trouble inflicted unjustly. Punishment or trouble inflicted unjustly. You know what he said? We suffer it. We just bear it. You know what the easiest thing to do when you suffer and you hurt? You want to hurt somebody else. You want to pass the hurt on to somebody else. You know the saying, hurting people hurt people. How many times will you get hurt and then you say something to somebody else and you think, man, why did I say that? But you were hurting somebody else. How many times, husbands and wives, you get in an argument? They say something that hurts, so what are you going to do? Man, I'm going to let go on you. I'm going to hurt you worse. And all you said it was, because you can hurt them. Why? Because you hurt. Paul says, you know what? I get hurt and I just keep it. I just bear it. wonder where he got that idea. That's what Jesus did. When defamed, that means you're slandered by dishonest reports. You know what he says? We entreat. It means, we, it, the word there is paracleto. It's, it's the same as paraclete. He says, we, we call for someone to help us. We call for someone, listen, who's going to help us pray for them. And I pray for them. Don't pray about them. Pray for them. And that takes the help of the Holy Spirit. And notice what he said. Listen, listen, he just said, he just said, remember, we're weak and you're strong. We're despised, you're honorable. He just told them how, what the contrast it is. He talked about how then when, when they're defamed, we just, you know what happened? When they got defamed, they took somebody to court. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. They were, they, were, they were all the wrong reactions. So that's why Paul had to say, listen, verse 14, I'm not writing this to shame you as my beloved sons, I warn you. I'm writing you because I love you and you're like my children. You're like my children. And they were in the gospel. They were spiritual children. So, listen. Though our position is often hard and steadfast, our disposition doesn't have to be that way. People may not like you or may not like us because of our position. But they ought not to dislike us because of our disposition. There's some people who take a, a good position, but man, they have a horrible disposition about it. And that's, that's awful. Let's have a right disposition as we take the right position. So, we're servants. We don't compare. We die to self. We have the right disposition. And then number five, remember our expectations. You're going to get to higher ground, you remember your expectation. Now listen carefully and we'll be done. Wherefore, verse 16, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere and in every church. Be ye followers of me. He said, hey, I brought you to Christ. I can bring you to be like Christ. That's a great statement. Each of us ought to so live that if others begin to live like us, they would live like Christ. Higher ground is being like Jesus Christ. Higher ground is allowing Him to live His life through us. That's higher ground. And Paul felt the responsibility that he be a pattern so others could follow him and be like Christ. He felt the burden. 
And Timothy caught it. You see what he said about Timothy? He said, he's my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, and he'll bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere and in every church. Paul said, listen, what I'm teaching you, I teach the same thing everywhere I go. I think if you'd have went to the church in Corinth, or the church in Ephesus, or the church in Colossae, or any of those Thessalonica, I think you'd have seen them operating about the same way. You know why? Paul said, that's my ways. And I told Timothy to instruct you in my way of doing things. And I believe my ways are in Christ, and I believe that you'll be more like Christ if you follow those ways. The expectation is, what's your expectation? Hey, that's just who I am, okay? You just got to put up with me. That's a pretty low expectation. That's what I expect out of someone who doesn't know Christ. But if you're going for higher ground, it's, you know what? I want to be like Jesus. I want to respond to situations like He would respond to situations. I want to handle things the way He would handle things. I want to suffer the way He'd suffer. I want to encourage like He'd encourage. I want to help like He'd help. I want to be like Christ. That's the expectation. Oh, to be like Thee. Oh, to be like Thee. Precious Redeemer, pure as Thou art, come in Thy fullness, come in Thy sweetness. Stamp Thine own image deep on my heart. That's higher ground. We're servants. We don't compare. We remember to die to self. We remember our disposition. And remember our expectation. To be like Christ. Be followers of Him. And realize some, some are going to follow you. Well, if they follow you, will you help them to follow Christ? Hmm? Higher ground. Let's get there. Let's ask God to put us on higher ground in 2016. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul and these words here from the book of 1 Corinthians and the church at Corinth. And Father, I'm praying this morning that you'll burden the heart of every individual here in this room as you burden my heart that we would desire higher ground. And that these keys to going to higher ground we would remember in our life for 2016. Oh, help us to be servants. Father, please help us not to compare one with another. Help us to die to self. Lord, please help us to have the right disposition and to, to follow our example of Jesus Christ. And oh, that our desire, our expectation would be that we could be like you. That we would walk in your steps. That others would see Christ in our life. So, Father, help us not to settle for less. Help us to press on to higher ground. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody looking this morning. You know, to press on to higher ground and to be like Christ, the first thing is you have to know Christ. You have to know Him as your Savior. I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I did receive Christ as my Savior. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed a Savior. And I knew Christ was the Savior I needed. And I prayed and asked Jesus to be my Savior. And I know that I'm saved this morning. Would you slip your hand up as a testimony and say, that's me, Pastor, on this first Sunday of 2016. I, I know I'm saved. Would you put your hand up, please? God bless you. You may put them down. Who's here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. I don't, I don't know for sure that I really know Christ as my Savior. Oh, I'm not saying you don't know about Him. I'm not saying you haven't heard about Him. But you don't know Him personally as your Savior. And you'd say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. I'm not sure that I know Christ. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up? And say, pray for me this morning, Pastor. Is there someone like that? The message was to believers today. Higher ground. And I wonder how many believers today would say, Preacher, God dealt with my heart this morning. And I want to press on to higher ground in 2016. And I want to take these keys, and I've written them down, and I'm going to keep looking at them. 
reminding myself of that, that God will plant my feet on higher ground in 2016. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart this morning. I want you to respond to Him. Remember, the way up is the way down. So you start going up to higher ground by falling to your knees and asking God to place you there. Asking God to work in you. It's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Ask Him to work in your life in 2016 and to plant your feet on higher ground. Heavenly Father, bless the invitation now. Thank You for speaking to hearts today. And Lord, I pray if there's any in the room that has never received Christ as their Savior, that they'd come and receive Him today as their Savior. If they're saved, never been baptized, that they ought to come and say, I need to obey the Lord in baptism. If they're saved and they're baptized and they believe this is where they ought to belong, I pray they'd come and say, we want to start 2016 out belonging to Bible Baptist Church. Lord, other believers are just going to come and bow the knee. And Lord, as they humble themselves, I pray that you would exalt them. And that you would plant their feet, plant our feet on higher ground in 2016. Have your way in this invitation now and in every person's heart. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing an invitation hymn. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. Will you please? Oh, to be like thee, That's blessed right. redeemer. Amen. This is my constant That's right. longing and prayer. Gladly Amen. I'll forfeit all of us treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee. Full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee while I am pleading, pour out thy spirit. Fill with thy love, make me a temple, meet for thy dwelling, fit me for life and heaven above. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Be seated just for a minute, if you would, please. Ushers, get the, uh, if you would like a calendar for 2016, uh, we gave these out on New Year's Eve and you weren't here to get it, then we want you to have one. Uh, this, this has everything going on this year, uh, right on the calendar. We do this because we believe you ought to build your life around your local church. Okay? Four of us do. We think you ought to build your life around the local church. Okay? And this helps you plan. And when you plan a vacation, you plan time away, you look to see what's happening. And uh, so you don't have to miss something that's going on. That may just, you don't know what God has on the calendar. 
this year that could be a life-changing thing for you. Okay? And so you don't want to miss anything. And so this will help you plan your time. And then we have a directory. If you'd like to have a directory, uh, we can give you that way to keep in contact with folks. I use it as a prayer guide and uh, use it to pray for folks in the pray one for another. And so if you'd like that, just stick your hand up and make sure the usher gets you one. And they'll make sure you get a calendar and a directory. Okay? Thank you, fellas. Appreciate you. Take care of that. Got on the front row down here, Xavier. Or Pete. Okay, he's got it. Okay. They don't share calendars. you got to give them their own. <laughs> All right. By the way, I think it's a beautiful calendar. And, uh, beautiful pictures on here. You're going to enjoy each month of the year. Uh, higher ground, the song, there's a, a, a verse on, uh, part of a verse on each month goes for the whole year. And uh, you'll enjoy uh, each month that gets turned the page there. All right. Well, I'm glad I came to church today. Amen. Hope you enjoyed the service. And, uh, you know, an uh, hour and a half, that's nothing. Right. I, I flipped over last night to that football game between <laughs> TCU and uh, Oregon. That was crazy. Oregon led 31 nothing at halftime. TCU won 47-41 in overtime. Three overtimes. I didn't, you know, when it kept going into overtime, I didn't say, come on, man, how late this going? When's this game going to be over? I thought, man, another overtime. Wow, that's great. My wife's upstairs saying, are you ever coming to bed? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, uh, this is great. The, the biggest comeback ever in the history of bowl games, and I got to see it. I'll probably forget it in two years, but I got to see it this year. But you know what I mean? We weren't, nobody was complaining about the time. Why is it we go to church and it goes an hour, you know, two minutes past 12, everybody says, hey, you know what time it is? <clears throat> what if church was like a football game? We were just here for three hours. What would that be like? It's kind of the way it was in Acts. Remember when they came to church and Ananias was there and then about three hours later his wife showed up for church. They were still there. She didn't know her husband had been there and lied and died. And, and then she came in and she lied and she died. And that, was, that was quite some service, wasn't it? But, uh, anyway. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm coming back tonight. Okay? 5.30 if you want the Christian growth class. And why do we use the King James Bible? Why do we believe that's the Word of God? You need to find out why. So come there for 5.30, then 6.30 tonight. How you can defeat depression. Okay, it'll be a help to you. Be in church on Sunday night. Pray for the nursing home today. Go to the nursing home service this afternoon. Pray for those going there. They'll have a good service there. All right, let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for using it in our hearts and lives today. Father, we leave this place desiring that you plant our feet on higher ground. Lord, we love you. We pray you'll give us a good afternoon and that you'll bring us back for the service this evening. Please be with those who are ill and unable to be in church today. Put your healing hand upon them. We'll thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.